All right, good morning and welcome everyone to the class today. We, this is uh, the class on Christian apologetics. Um, so good morning, welcome. Let's take a moment just to pray together and then we will get um, started. I'll uh, request somebody to pray with us as a class and then we will get started. Could somebody lead us in prayer, please? Well, Father, we thank you, Lord, for this morning. Thank you, Lord, for teaching us on Christian apologetics. Help us, Lord, for the learning of this. Lord, we will be equipped and able to give a valid defense to everyone who has reason for our hope. Lord, as we are ready to hear more from you, teach us, Lord, by your Spirit. Bless the first. Bless every one of us, Father. We thank you for teaching us and equipping us more and more for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Good morning once again. We, uh, this class is being recorded for the benefit of others uh, who will be uh, listening to it later. So we are right now in our second topic or theme uh, in this course on apologetics, which is uh, we've been discussing the uh, uh, authenticity and the accuracy of uh, the scriptures, the Bible, uh, the 66 books of the Bible. Uh, so we've been talking about that uh, last week. We uh, spent some time just uh, trying to understand uh, how the Bible came to us, the, um, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the manuscripts, uh, the reliability of, the scripts, uh, of these manuscripts, and how these have been then uh, uh, put together for us. And, uh, you know, so we, saw, we said, okay, these, the text of the scriptures, is highly reliable based on uh, you know the, the the criteria that is generally used which is the number of manuscripts that are available and also the the time gap that uh, that is considered so uh, we said based on that the scriptures are very reliable today uh, we're continuing on 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 the same theme uh, in this first hour uh, what we will look at very quickly in is the next two questions, which is one is uh, how was how were the scriptures canonized? And I'll explain well, how how did we receive get the canon of scripture? And then uh, the next question, the third question or the last question we want to answer is, you know, um, why are, uh, what is the difference between why are there this so many vers English versions of the Bible and what is the difference between those versions and so on, right? So uh, my, my plan, my hope today is uh, we'll finish that in the first hour. And then uh, after the break in the second hour, we can we'll move to the, to the next topic, which is um, we focus on the person of Christ and so on and the uniqueness of Christ. And, you know, the next week we pick up on the resurrection of Christ and uh, things related to the person of Jesus Christ himself. So my hope is to be able to finish um, the, uh, the, uh, the the learning about the scriptures uh, in this first hour and then move into our next topic uh, after the break. All right, so um, we're going to, uh, I will share with you the PDF and our students are just coming in. So um, let's see, I think, well, if I if I shift to the PDF, the some students might get locked out. Anyway, let me just go ahead and do it. Um, all right. So what we want to do is to understand how we got the canon of scripture. So the word canon uh, uh, literally means a rod, a straight rod. Uh, and then by extension, it came to, you know, mean a rule or a measure. And then by extension, it came to mean a standard. 
uh, you know, so when we talk about the canon of scripture, we're talking about uh, uh, the the scriptures, the list of books that are uh, acknowledged to be the rule of belief and practice. So it's, it's this is the standard. Uh, this is the rule uh, for our faith, uh, the rule for our belief and practice. So canons scriptures so what we're trying to understand is uh, you know how did these scriptures come to us so we talk first about the old testament uh, now these notes are out there in your coursework i just put it out there this morning so you can pick it up and read through it in detail i will explain it for us so how did the old testament come to uh, us uh, now us means uh, as christians but of course uh, they were first the hebrew they were first belong to the Jews or the Hebrew scriptures. So and then we talk about the New Testament. So let's understand about the Old Testament scriptures. Now, just a little background here uh, is uh, the Hebrew Bible. That is the, the scriptures that the Jews had, which we would have referred to as the Hebrew Bible, the, which is part of Judaism. Um, they had the uh, first five books that belonged to the law, or called referred to as the law of Moses. Uh, Moses wrote those five books. Then the prophets, and uh, which can, uh, consists um, of these eight books: uh, Joshua, Judges, and all the way uh, Ezekiel and Isaiah, and also the minor prophets or the small, lesser, smaller prophets. The twelve books there, and uh, then also the sacred writings. So the writings consisted of these 11 books, the Psalms, Proverbs, and so on, right? So th this was the original set of books. And we would talk about how, you know, why they, why these books and so on. But I'm just giving you a little background here. So this was the original set of books, which the Jews are the, uh, considered as their sacred scriptures and their reasons for it. We will, we'll, we'll mention it. Um, and uh, this was the Hebrew Bible, which we today refer to as the Old Testament. Now, of course, when we compiled as the Old Testament, there were some, you know, we first and second Samuel, first and second Kings. There were some adjustments, uh, rearranging. Ezra and Nehemiah separated. First and second Chronicles and Ruth was placed in there. All right. So uh, uh, when we compiled it, or when we say we compiled it, meaning when it was put into the the scriptures as we know, the Bible. There was, it was the, the same old Hebrew Bible, but just, uh, I would say, packed together slightly differently. Now, the Hebrew text, the traditional Bible, uh, the original Hebrew text was known as the Masoretic Test, Masoretic Test, text. And that uh, Hebrew text was also discovered among the Dead Sea Scrolls, which we spoke about last week, uh, the mid 1900s. Now, the Greek version of that often uh, is referred to as the Septuagint. So this is the Greek translation of the Hebrew text, right? So just some background. Now, as far as the Old Testament is concerned, uh, the last book, uh, or, or the, the last book, Malachi, uh, was somewhere around 435 BC, right? approximately around that time. So about 400 years or so uh, before uh, uh, before Christ. Right? And uh, that, that's the last prophet, Malachi. Uh, the history books, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, uh, they they were the last history books. This was after the uh, people returned back to, uh, around the time the people returned back from Babylon uh, and resettled back in Jerusalem. Uh, this was again somewhere around the mid 400 BC, somewhere 445 to 433 BC, right? So the last of the prophetic prophets, the last of the history books, the writings, all of them came together somewhere around 4, 430, 420 uh, BC, right? So 
basically by that time, okay, let's say even if you round it up to about 400 BC, by that time, the Hebrew scripture, or which we refer to as the Old Testament, was complete, right? So they had the law of Moses, uh, they had the prophets, so coming close to about mid 400 BC, that was complete. Uh, the history books, the writings, uh, the history comes down to about, again, mid 400 BC done. And uh, so that was their complete set of scriptures. And we will talk about why they looked at it as scriptures and so on. I'm just giving the background here. So around this time, they, you know, it was like God stopped speaking to his people, meaning there weren't anybody else coming as a prophet, as a recognized mouthpiece or a prophet of God and, and saying, thus says the Lord, right? Until later John the Baptist came. But from about mid 400 BC with Malachi, ending with Malachi, um, that was it. You know, the, there was no more inspired uh, people coming with inspiration and saying, this is the Lord's, thus said the Lord, right? So, uh, but with that came the complete collection of Hebrew scriptures. Now, there was no single person, there was no single council or a group of people that decided that this was going to be the collection of Old Testament Hebrew scriptures. So Hebrew, let me use the word Hebrew scripture because we refer to it as Old Testament, but originally it is the Hebrew scriptures. So there was no individual or collection of you know, leaders who said, okay, these are the scriptures, but it actually happened over time, right? So this collection of sacred writings uh, took place over time. The one person that we could point to at the, uh, around this period, you know, Nehemiah, Ezra, we said, was the last of the history books. Uh, Nehemiah, Ezra, Esther, the last of these history books to be put together. So Ezra was a scribe and a priest uh, who returned back from the Babylonian captivity. And he came back to Jerusalem around that time. And so he had the entire collection of the Hebrew scriptures of what we refer to as the Old Testament, right? Ezra the priest. Right? And you find that uh, 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 in, in the book of Ezra itself. So he um, is, uh, is uh, uh, what, what, what we say, he is, we're not saying he's the one who decided on the collection, but he had the collection and he preserved the collection, bringing it back into Jerusalem. Because remember, prior to that time, uh, Nebuchadnezzar had come in, he had dis dis destroyed the temple, they destroyed uh, Jerusalem and gone. But Ezra the priest, and of course the people with him in the synagogue at that time, uh, uh, did his part in preserving much of these sacred writings. And so, therefore, uh, he ha he had in his possession the collection of the sacred scriptures, right? Uh, bringing it back into Jerusalem. But then, uh, like we said earlier, uh, there is uh, no one person who decided on the collection of the Old Testament scriptures, but what do we know? What can we say with confidence is that uh, over time, right from the beginning, over time, starting with Moses and on over time, uh, this community, meaning the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, they, based on certain criteria, which we have listed here, uh, recognized these writings as sacred, as divinely inspired. And now we understand and we know that, you know, uh, initially uh, things were passed on orally and then the, or 
the prophets spoke and people wrote down what the prophets spoke or the prophets themselves wrote themselves wrote it and then of course there were people who recorded things so some of these writings were spoken and written at one go that means the prophet spoke there it was documented written some of these things were collected over time so for example the psalms and the proverbs were collected over time but the criteria that this community this that means you're talking about the hebrews the jewish people that this community had to recognize any of these writings as sacred or as, as given by god were, were these first and foremost was was the man was a person speaking under divine inspiration so you know did the prophet say thus says the lord was he speaking on behalf of god so when moses spoke on behalf of god that was recognized as scripture meaning this is something that is given to us by God, right? Uh, uh, similarly, Isaiah and other prophets. Uh, was, uh, was he a German prophet of God? So was a person bringing the message recognized as a prophet of God? Uh, did the writings agree with previous uh, writings which were considered sacred so when moses gave forth the uh, the five first five books so there was a certain uh, uh, established truth already that was accepted as given by somebody who spoke under inspiration and by somebody who was a genuine prophet of god so uh did other prophets of god uh, others who spoke in, on behalf of God, uh, what they spoke, which was wrote, written, or what they wrote, was it in agreement with previous doctrine? Did other prophets recognize earlier prophets? Right? Did they recognize the writings? And most importantly, or I, I'm not saying most importantly, but a very important criteria was: Did these writings survive through time? So. Uh, looking back right and I, i'm not saying these people sat down at that time and said look these are the five criteria that we're going to select scriptures no they didn't do it like that uh, it happened over time uh, it, it was really the hand of god guiding these people but us today looking back can list these as unspoken unstated criteria by which something was recognized by this community and talking about the Jews, the Hebrew people, uh, by the Jews as part of the Hebrew scriptures, right? So like we said earlier, it wasn't like one person sat down and said, okay, this is in and this is out. Uh, it wasn't some group of people who sat down and said, this is in and this is out. But it is something that took place over time, over, you know, uh, like we're saying what over 1,500 years or so, uh, among this community by which they recognized that these set of writings, the Hebrew Bible, are divinely inspired and they're God word to us because the person speaking spoke in the name of the Lord on behalf of God, under the inspiration of God. And so we are keeping these as, uh, uh, these are the, scriptures given to us right so uh, once again just uh, going over the same thing Malachi was the last recognized prophet finished around 400 BC and uh, these collection of sacred writings by that time so basically by 400 BC they had these you know what we now refer to as the 39 books of the old testament uh, they had these books uh, this community the the jews had these books uh, as god's divinely inspired scriptures given to them and they held it 
in that manner, right? So this collection that of sacred writings, which took place over time, uh, was referred to as the Holy Scriptures. Right? Now, uh, around this time, of course, there were other historical writings. So whether it was the, you know, the record of uh, other things that happened in the life of this community as they progressed through time, uh, or we also have uh, in the intertestamental period, that means from 400 BC till uh, about, you know, the coming of John the Baptist, which is about 400, to, approximately 400 years, uh, there were other books that were written uh, among the same people. But whether it was other historical writings or whether it is what is known as the Ap Apocrypha, which, which is, uh, we'll just mention that a little bit, but other books, these were not accepted by the Jews as inspired by God. I mean, they were, you know, literary works or human works by people in the community and among the community. Of course, the people write, so there are a lot of other writings as well. Uh, interestingly, many of these other historical writings have all perished. They're, they're not there. So even if you want, they're not there. They've been destroyed, gone. Now, what we do have is certain books written during that 400-year period, during the intertestamental period, which uh, the Roman Catholic Church and a few other churches like the Greek, Russian, uh, uh, Orthodox and the Ethiopic churches have included as part of their text. But the Hebrews did not. For them, with the end of Malachi, that was more or less the end of their scriptures. The reason being Malachi was the last recognized prophet. And they had this criteria that only what a prophet spoke would they consider as inspired. It's not that they were closed thereafter for any inspiration. It's just that they did not recognize any other prophet amongst them so that there was no more scriptures or no more sacred writings after Malachi, right? So I'm talking about the Hebrew Bible, the Jewish community, they did not recognize any of these writings as sacred. Uh, they were there, but the main criteria was they didn't recognize them as divinely inspired, right? There was no divine inspiration. And so they did not include them as part of their Hebrew scriptures post the last book, uh, post the prophet Malachi. So this is how these scriptures were given to us, right? Basically, the Old Testament was, uh, was canonized. Now, again, canonized is a word that we brought in later on, but they're saying it was a, the complete set of scriptures, the Hebrew Bible, which was recognized by the Jewish community as inspired by God, was put together and, and was, you know, was, uh, I'm using the word compiled, but again, you know, you, you must understand it. It's not that they were thinking, okay, we're writing a book kind of thing, but no, this, these are the scriptures. This is a collection of scriptures that we recognize as divinely inspired. Uh, that took place by about 400 BC. And after that, they did not accept anything else as they did not recognize. They did not recognize any other prophet. Uh, therefore, there was no more additions to those set of that collection of scriptures. Right? Now, right, so that gives us an understanding of how the old, uh, what we refer to as the Old Testament books came into existence. Okay. They refer to it as their say, holy scriptures. Uh, they refer to it as or the Hebrew Bible. Okay, But we now, later on, we've taken that uh, and we'll give, you reason, we'll give us reasons why the church embraced it. But we've taken that and recognized that as the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, 
is now the Old Testament for us. Okay. Now, so we had this 400 years of silence. That means there's no prophet speaking in the name of the Lord, or speaking under divine inspiration. <coughs> Sorry, excuse me. And then uh, comes John the Baptist. So the Old Testament. Uh, was completed, like we said, somewhere around mid-430 or by, definitely by 400 BC. And uh, there's no further revelation till John the Baptist comes speaking. So John the Baptist is the next recognized prophet of God. So they have these uh, 400 to 450 years of silence in between the intertestamental uh, intertestament period. And now comes John the Baptist. And he, of course, is announcing the coming of Christ. And uh, then Jesus comes. Jesus does his preaching. And uh, uh, then we have the birth of the church. Now, during this time, we must understand, like we already said, Jesus recognized the Old Testament scriptures. Jesus himself, in his teaching and preaching, recognized the Old Testament scriptures. So when Jesus talked about the, the, the Old Testament scriptures, refer to the scriptures, he's referring to this entire collection that was already in existence. Right? Which we said by about 400 BC, it was all put together. It was there, the collection. So when he, Jesus recognized the authority and he quoted from it, whether for his own personal use and defending against Satan or when in his preaching or in his responding to questions, he pointed back to the scriptures they had. So when Jesus said, you search the scriptures, he was referring to this complete collection of, you know, we have broken it into his 39 books, right? That he was referring to those 39 books. So you know the scriptures. So, and uh, uh, so that's Jesus. And then when the New Testament, uh, the apostles started preaching, for them, the same Old Testament scriptures was authoritative. So why do the why does the church look at the Old Testament? Well, because it was just a continuation that okay, God has spoken to. Uh, the prophets, Malachi. But now he's, there was a period of silence, about 400 years, 450 years of silence. But now God is continuing the same God of the Old Testament, of the Hebrew Bible. The same God is now continuing to speak, but now he has started speaking through his son. And so when the apostles came, they recognized both the words of Jesus and the Old Testament scriptures. So Peter in his very first sermon stands up and he quotes from the Old Testament scriptures. And all, you know, all the Paul in his, in his writings, uh, he's quoting from the Old Testament scriptures. So in the mind, uh, in the teachings of Jesus and in the mind of the early Christians, starting from the apostles, this the Hebrew Bible, which we are referring to as the Old Testament scriptures, was part of God's word because Jesus quoted from it and the apostles quoted from it, taught from it. Now, in addition to the Old Testament, the words of Jesus, the words of Jesus held authority. This is what Jesus taught us. So you can imagine, or of course, the 12 apostles, they were with Jesus for three and a half years. They heard the things Jesus spoke to them, and this was kept in their heart. And like Jesus said, the Holy Spirit will bring to your remembrance everything I've taught you. So there was the divine enabling of the Holy Spirit. And in those days, the 12 apostles were not, you know, note takers. They were not going around taking notes. Uh, you know, I mean, they may have written something, we don't know. But really, it was the divine agency of the Holy Spirit that enable these apostles to remember the teachings of Jesus. Because whatever I've taught you, he will bring to your remembrance, Jesus said. Right? So the apostles continued with the preaching and teaching of Jesus. Right? 
So they continue. So this was passed on orally, right? Uh, it was passed on verbally uh, through the teaching of the apostles after Jesus. And then subsequently came, of course, the writings. You know, the uh, we, we will look at the transition that that was made, but the writings of the apostles came, and that's when the New Testament was put together. And we'll talk about that. Right? Now. So having understood how the Old Testament came and having understood the whole transition, that it there was a break, uh, a period of silence. But with the arrival of John the Baptist and uh, the coming of Christ, God continued to speak. And so the Old Testament scriptures are very much connected to the new. It's not like we are borrowing something from a different faith. No. It is a continuation of the same God speaking. And so the New Testament just fits in. It's basically a continuation of God speaking after that period of silence. Now, when we talk about the New Testament, um, the, uh, the first time we see somebody referring to the New Testament scriptures is actually only uh, about 350 years or oh, let's say about 300 years later um, uh, by uh, uh, the Bishop of Alexandria, uh, Egypt in AD 367. So uh, how did this come about? How did these 20, uh, 27 books of the New Testament come about? How did that happen? Again, we just trace this. Now, uh, once again, the same thing, no one person, no individual sat down and decided that these 27 books will make up the New Testament. It didn't happen like that. But even the coming together with New Testament happened very similar to how the Old Testament came together, right? How did it happen? So uh, we can look at it in, 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 in these four periods of time. So, like we already mentioned, uh, if you look at the early period, AD 30 to 100, there was Jesus, uh, three and a half years of ministry. The apostles were with Jesus. They heard his teachings. They received his revelation. Uh, some of the apostles, sorry, the later apostles, mainly Paul and the others, wrote them down, right? So initially, they heard his teaching, they heard the teachings of Jesus. Subsequently, uh, in the first century, they wrote them down. This, these were the letters and the gospels and the epistles and so on. They were written down. But now, uh, they had to transmit it. The initial transmission in the early church, all of it was oral, meaning the uh, you know that's how the early church was taught. And they didn't have mass... Uh, production of uh, of uh, Bibles and all. Uh, the writings were there, but the writings were read to the churches. They were read out aloud to the people. So uh, it wasn't like everybody had their own copy of Paul's epistle or James' letter or, well, no, it wasn't there. It was oral. It was read out to people. They heard it. They received that and that's how they went about the Christian life. So they had these documents. Uh, so these uh, these letters written by the early apostles were authoritative documents. Let me say this was written by Paul. This was written by you know one of the apostles. So these were authoritative documents but remember uh, they were written, they were kept but um, People, not everybody had copies. They were transmitted orally. But what happened? Believers began to feel the need for these written scriptures, these sacred writings, because uh, oral transmissions uh, were being used less. So now slowly, the second generation, uh, they had to slowly make a transition from depending on a few copies to making many more copies of what was written by 
the recognized apostles. They knew, okay, this was Peter. This was written by Paul. This was written by, um, you know, James was the brother of Jesus. This was written by Matthew, Mark, Luke. So this collection of scriptures was already in some way kept sacred. There are a lot of other writings, but why were these writings held sacred? Because they were written by the apostles. So if there were letters written by unknown people, they were not included. If there were written letters or things written by other people who were not the apostles, not one of them, they were not included. Right? So although there was no formal process of saying, of somebody sitting and saying, this are the canon of scriptures, just like what happened to the Old Testament, the New Testament scriptures was implicitly collected based on who wrote them. Uh, is, is it authentic? Is it written by somebody who was an apostle of Christ? Right. So that was the collection. And then later on, they had to transition from oral, orally communicating to, look, we have to share the writings. So copies were being made. Right? Uh, another thing that drove people to reproduce this collection of 27 written documents was there were a lot of other things spreading around. So there are a lot of people writing other kinds of things. Uh, there are a lot of people preaching and teaching other kinds of things, heresies. And so it became more important now to pass on as widely as possible this collection of 27 written documents, uh, pass it on. Right? So they did not call it New, New Testament as yet. They didn't call it as, okay, this is the canon of scripture. No. So it was happening more as, look, we know who, these are authentic. Who wrote these? Uh, these are the teachings we're going to live by. Uh, this generation of believers were not there. They didn't hear Jesus, but we've got what Jesus spoke here in the gospels. Um, we haven't directly heard some of these early apostles, but we have the writings. So we are going to pass them on okay so it you know it happened in, in some sort of an informal way but yet the hand of god was on that whole process of spreading the, those selected writings which were known to be written by reliable people that means the apostles themselves so then there was this definite transition uh, be moving away from oral tradition to written scripture because now uh, you know you don't have uh, the apostles around they're not there the last apostle died around 80 90 uh, and uh, the dependence now is on the writings and the writings then became the authoritative source so obviously you have to transition from you know what so and so heard peter preach to look we have his episode no, uh, you know, the last, last, maybe the people who did hear about, hear Paul preach are all gone now. So you only can read what Paul wrote. So by about 170 AD, the, the concept of the New Testament scriptures, now look, uh, we are saying concept because they, they were not thinking of, okay, uh, you know, let's put this, let's call it the New Testament or you no, know, but they had embraced these 27 texts as the writings by which we are going to live by, right? Uh, and they're going to follow that. So by about one, uh, you know, shortly after the first century, by definitely by 8170, this was all well established. They had not yet quote unquote canonized it as we formally refer to it, but the concept was there. Right? And uh, you find some of the early uh, church fathers uh, independently beginning to refer to uh, these 27 scriptures as 
the New Testament, right? But this happened a little later, right? Around the end of the second century, okay? So now formally they are calling this as the New Testament, right? Now, remember in, in, in their minds, the tes Testament means covenant, covenant, right? So uh, they, they, they say, okay, this is the new covenant, understanding. Basically, it's an extension of what, what has been taught in the scriptures, a new covenant. Jesus said he's establishing a new covenant. So these are the books that represent the new covenant for us, right? And that comes in a little later, around 8200, uh, more by the church fathers who then begin to refer to this collection of 27 books as the new covenant. So the last step then is the formal recognition. Okay? So this comes even later. So these 27 books of the New Testament was then later, almost 150 years later, uh, after the uh, Church Fathers, uh, uh, formally recognized as the canon of Scripture. But remember, they had already been established. So around 380, 350, 80, they were not selecting the books. They were only recognizing the books, okay? The selection happened way back, right after, uh, you know, towards the end of the first century. That means when John had finished writing it, the selection was implicit because you'd only select the books written by the apostles, the people who had been with Jesus, the people who had documented his sayings, the people who are uh, inspired by the Holy Spirit. So the selection was implicit. Of course, they didn't call it New Testament at that time. They didn't call it uh, canon of scripture at that time, but it was an implicit collection of the writings of these apostles. Okay. The second generation continued with that set of documents. They didn't call it New Testament. They didn't call it canon of scripture, but they begin to transition to those documents. Subsequently, that was the only thing they had because no, nobody else around and they, that was the only, they, this collection of 27 books became the basis of teaching, but they still had not yet, you know, called it New Testament or canon of scripture. Okay, but it was already fixed, these 27 books. Then comes the use of the term New Covenant or New Testament, somewhere towards 1780. And then comes the formal recognition. So various councils, uh, that means these were just church leaders who came. Again, uh, the emphasis is uh, not one single council or not one single person did this, but various councils around the same time uh, that means these are church leaders in various parts of the Christian world began to recognize these 27 books, right? Uh, the Lee church leaders in Laodicea were among the earliest. Uh, they recognized the 27 new 26 New Testament books, and then later on they recognized the book of Revelation by John, so that made it 27. Um, then, like we mentioned, the, the Bishop of Alexandria, uh, in 8367. So he was the first person to formally recognize that these were the canon of scripture, that these were the books of the New Testament. And then there were others. So Jerome, he translated these 27 books into Latin. So again, he restricted himself just to these 27 books because said, look, these are the 27 books that are that we know are the writings and the works of the apostles that bring to us the Christian faith. And then there were others, you know, so St. Augustine, the Council of Hippo, uh, the Council of God. So various church councils, meaning groups of leaders in different parts of that area, uh, begin to recognize, formally recognize that this 27 books will form the canon of New Testament scripture. Okay. So obviously, Remember, the New Testament church, the early church, had the Hebrew Bible as uh, the basis of all their teaching. And now 
they also had the writings of the apostles, the 27 books, right? So these 39 books of the Old Testament, 27 books of the New Testament were then compiled together and, um, you know, formally recognized as the scriptures, the whole scriptures of the church. And from there on, we have the Bible for us. Okay. So that's a, a, a quick story on how the Old and the New Testament uh, 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 came to us. So let's take up some questions and then we will take a break and come on. Now I still haven't finished what I wanted to finish. Uh, we still have a sec another section, to go, a couple of sections to go. We'll, we'll do it after the break. All right, so let's look at uh, some questions here. Samuel, does Paul quote from writings that are outside the Old Testament books? The thoughts of Book of Enoch. Uh, uh, and okay, how do we know that the book of Hebrews was written by an apostle? All right. Good question. So as far as um, we know, so Paul, he, okay, did Paul quote from the writings that are outside the book? So, so Paul used uh, his knowledge, not just of the Old Testament books, but general knowledge so, so in his conversation. So we know, right? Uh, for instance, in the book of Acts, you see it, and also in First Corinthians, you see it, where Paul is referencing certain material information outside of the Old Testament scriptures. So in Acts 17, Paul, you know, he quotes from poetry that the people of Athens had. So he says, even as some of your old prophets have said, you know, uh, in him we live and move and have our being. So that tech, that quote is not from any of the Old Testament scriptures. That quote is a quote from the writings of the Greek philosophers. Or in First Corinthians 15, Paul says, you know, look, uh, those who, he's, he's, he's referring to, you know, what these people do who uh, baptize for the dead. And so he's referring to a custom of the people and he's, you know, referencing that. So to answer your question, Samuel, did he quote from outside? Yeah, you find minor references here and there, uh, but that doesn't make those texts as, you know, he's just quoting it as part of his conversation or as part of his preaching, not because they're inspired, but because they are understood by his audience. The audience know what he's talking about. So in, to answer, to, so in that's, that sense, yes, he did quote from outside the Old Testament books, but that's not because those were inspired, but, but because they were known by his audience and he used that to communicate a thought or a point uh, to the people, okay? So the second part of your question, the book of Enoch, yes, there are a lot of books, like we mentioned, uh, a lot of books that have not uh, perished or that have uh, uh, existed. You know, like we said, there are other books outside of the uh, 39 books of the Old Testament. But the Jewish community did not consider them as inspired and so did not include them into the Hebrew scriptures. So it was a process of elimination that the community itself did based on, like we said, the criteria that they had. Now we put down these five points retrospectively, meaning we look back and say, okay, maybe these are the criteria they used, but they were working in it forward. So they chose not to include the book of Enoch or other history, you know, works that were done during those, their lifetime. Uh, based on, you know, like, this is not inspired by God. It doesn't contain uh, matter inspired by God, right? So they just chose not to include it. Um, so last, uh, the next question here is the book of Hebrews. How do we know that the book of Hebrews was written by an apostle? Now, uh, there is, yeah, like we, we understand that there's a lot of question on who wrote the book of Hebrews. Now, just because, um, you know, the authorship, the reason the authorship is disputed is because it is not explicitly stated, you know. So in Hebrews, like unlike Paul's other epistles, he, he always, Paul always starts with the authorship. I, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ writing to you, right? 
unlike that, Hebrews or, you know, many of the other apostles have a statement of authorship. Unlike that, Hebrews does not have a statement of authorship. That's the only uh, question. But in terms of content, in terms of what it's presenting to us, that all of it is aligned both with the Old Testament scripture and with New Testament teaching. Right? So uh, although the authorship is disputed, or um, let's not, not, let me say that the authorship is not clearly stated, the content is consistent right? with uh, the writings of both the Old and the New Testament. Uh, the other New Testament scriptures. In my mind, it seems like, you know, it's the work of the Apostle Paul. And uh, although we can't state it, uh, it's not stated, so therefore we can't state it. But it seems like the work of the Apostle Paul. But, to, uh, but if the question is, uh, was this... Uh, yeah, uh, 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 and work of an apostle. All we can say is, the early church recognized it to be the work of an apostle, even though it was not stated. It is it is not stated in the letter, but they recognized it, and so they included it as part of these twenty-seven collected texts. So we today are basing our confidence in the early church's recognition of the source of the book of Hebrews, that for them it was, they recognized it, uh, even though it was not stated. And so we're going by that. So that would be my response to you, Samuel. Okay. All right, maybe we'll take one question from Say, and then we will uh, take a break, please. Say. Yeah, um, I just wanted to ask, Pastor, um, if certain books like the Book of Enoch, right? Well, but let me ask this question first of all. Me, number one question: Was the Book of Enoch written by Enoch himself? That's first question. Then the se third, second question is: If these books were being referenced, I'm just wondering why didn't the Jewish uh, community at that time, why the Jewish leaders, why didn't they just add it? As part of the by, by the books, you know, since it was being referenced in in the um in the writings of the prophet, it's so I think one of the prophets or some prophets, um, is, is this some prophets or some of the some of the old um the Old Testament writings refer to the Book of Enoch, the Book of Jasa, you know, all those books. Why did why wasn't it just included then? If that's the case, that's what I'm going to say. Um. So um, I kind of heard your question in part. Um, I couldn't hear your question fully. Um, uh, your voice is a little soft, so I'm trying to. Can, can you hear me now? Can you, okay. can you hear me clearly? Yeah, go ahead. Um, yeah, go ahead. Say, I, 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 okay, I think your question was, now, why weren't, um, I'm just repeating the question just to make sure I heard you clearly. Um, the question was, why aren't, why weren't some of the Old Testament, I mean, some of the books written around the Old Testament, like the Book of Enoch and uh, other books, uh, included in the Hebrew Scriptures? Is that your question? Yeah, why weren't they included if they were being, if they were being referenced, right? Oh, so uh, the Book of Enoch was not, is not, uh, so okay, so when when I said Paul referenced some some text, um, you know, the, uh, okay, okay, let me say. So in the Old Testament, there are mentions of other uh, um, books, uh, books, and so on. Yeah, in the Old Testament, yeah, there are there is mention of other books. Now they they are not included simply because a lot of it, uh, and from I'm, I'm speaking from what I understand. Uh, a lot of it references historical information, right? So, um, uh, so it's you know you would find things like in especially in Chronicles and Kings, okay, and, and the and the work of this king you will find it in the book of this, 
right? And the work of this king, you will find it in the book of this. So those have been left out because they are historical in nature, first. Second, what is needed to be known about that king and what he did is already documented in uh, the Chronicles of Kings or in Sam, First and Second Samuel, right? So these are two reasons. So when, I mean, for us looking at it, right, uh, that the, the reason why the Jewish people would not have added all these other historical records into the collection of scripture. One, because their focus was on what is God saying? What is God speaking? And when a prophet is writing, you know, uh, or a scribe is writing, recording what a prophet is saying, and he says, okay, if you want to know something more about this king, you can read it up there in that historical book. Uh, the, that's it. You know, if you want history, you go there. But if you want, but the focus in these Hebrew, Hebrew Bible, the Hebrew scriptures is, what is God speaking? What is God saying? And we want to stay with what is coming forth from the mouth of the prophet or through the prophet. So, uh, and whatever is needed to be known about that particular king is sufficiently recorded in, you know, in these, uh, whether it's in Samuel Kings or Chronicles. So, uh, and I'm speaking just, you know, looking back res retrospectively on why would they have not included it? Uh, because it was a historical work, not an inspired work. It was a work of a man. Secondly, what was needed to be known about the king was sufficiently recorded here. That's all you need to know about the king and his works and his administration and his rulership, etc. This is enough. So I'm looking back and saying, okay, these were probably the two reasons why all these other books were not, uh, you know, included. Uh, historical books were not included in the holy scriptures of uh, the Hebrew people. Thank you, okay. Pastor. So was the book of Enoch written by Enoch himself or was it, was it written by somebody else? Because I've kind of read it. Um, it talks more about um, fallen angels, how they um, went into the women of that time um, pre Noah, um, before the flood, right? It's talking about um, fallen angels, a lot of things about the how mm -hmm. in, um, sons, the sons of God, basically angels, you know, had affairs, um, had sexual interaction with uh, women of that time, and then later on, the Lord found um, cast just different things and all that, basically. But you, you, we can see that there was a reference in Genesis that talked about. And the sons of God went into women and they started giving birth to giants and all that. And everything has been explained in that book of Enoch. So I'm just wondering, was it Enoch who wrote it or somebody else who wrote that book of Enoch? Okay. So we'll, we'll answer this and then we'll go for a break. So um, uh, from my understanding, I can, I'll just check this again. Um, these were things recorded. Uh, probably attributed to Enoch, but not necessarily everything from Enoch himself. So meaning, uh, you know, example, if I'm recording what you're saying, uh, I can record some of the things you say, but I can also, you know, add a lot of other matter and information, so on. Uh, so that forms, uh, you know, the book of Enoch. Um, secondly, the what was needed to be known is sufficiently recorded for us in the book of a reliable source, in this case, Moses himself. So Moses is a prophet of God, and he has sufficiently recorded, you know, in Genesis chapter 6, what is needed to be known about what happened. So the... Hebrews or the Jewish people say, look, we know Moses is a prophet of God. We know he's the mouthpiece of God. He's given to us these five books, which covers this whole period when Enoch lived and subsequently, we, it fully covers it. He has already documented for us what we need to know right from creation all the way till 
the end of his life. He has already documented for us everything we need to know. That's one reason. Second, the Book of Enoch, its source is questionable, right? Uh, it may have a few things that Enoch said, but it has a lot of other things that has nothing to do with Enoch. And so we are not going to include that as our inspired scriptures. Rather, we will go with the prophet of God, the most man of God, Moses. We know him. He's the mouthpiece of God. And what has come through him is the inspired scriptures. Is that okay? Yes, that's okay. Thank you, Pastor. Thank okay. You. Let's take a break and I'll, we will come back and um, look at the questions. It's good. A lot of questions are coming. Um, let's take a quick break and come back and uh, we will proceed uh, with the questions, please. Back in 10 minutes, right? Thanks.